Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Katherine Hecht. I'm the Executive Director of the Alexander Valley Film Society, and I'm thrilled to welcome you into my home studio, where we are broadcasting live the Alexander Valley Film Festival, 6th Annual, 2020. We will not be held back. I'm so excited to have you here because we have a fantastic experience lined up for you right now. Thanks to Renee Finelli, a former board member and longtime supporter of the Film Society, we were introduced to a story many months ago uh, from director Christine Yu. She was working on a story about a running club in San Quentin. And thanks to her husband, Michael Finelli from Healdsburg Sotheby's, who is also a longtime sponsor of this organization, we were able to start digging into the story, keeping up with Christine, and following her progress as she was tracking towards completion. And now, today, something that we've never done before, we are presenting to you a film in progress. If you haven't already seen it, there is footage available to you categorized as a short film within the slate of films this year. And we're probably going to start our conversation today. Well, not probably, I know we are, but after we have some introductions, we're gonna show you a little bit of that footage before we launch into our conversation. There's so much to be learned from this film, the parallels of resilience and training and discipline, mental health, social justice. It's a tight pack of goodness. And I'm so honored to bring in our guest to talk about this film today. So without further ado, please welcome Christine Yu, Franklin Ruana, Markel Taylor, and Tim and Diana Fitzpatrick. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm giddy. I'm so excited you're here. <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to switch this tile like that because I don't want our logo to cover Markel's hands and face. Let's get started. How about everybody give us a quick introduction to who you are and why you're at the table with us today. Christine, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, hi, I am Christine. I'm the uh, director and producer for the film. Uh, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> 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 Tim and Diana, how about you? Uh, okay, my name is Diana, and I've been coaching with the uh, Thousand Mile Track Club at San Quentin for about 10 years. I got involved through Frank, who I've known for many years, uh, through running. He was one of the first people that Tim and I met when we moved here to, to uh, the Bay Area from New York. And my name is Tim Fitzpatrick. I've been coaching running teams on and off from high school to adults for the last 25 years. And I've been coaching San Quentin for the last six with Frank and the team. Frank, sir, how about you? I'm Frank Rana. I uh, started coaching the Thousand Mile Club in 2005 and uh, I've been there for about 15 years now. And Markel? I'm Markel Taylor, and I've been running uh, San Quentin uh, for a few years, and now I'm here. And now you're here. And before we go any further, should we talk about what happened this morning? Yes. Yes. Who wants to tell us? Well, we, Markel Taylor ran a virtual marathon on the uh, Napa Marathon course started at 7 a.m. this morning and finished at 10 and 6 seconds. <laughs> so, Mark, three, three hours and six seconds. And he was trying to he was trying to do a sub three, sub three hours, right? right. But three hours and six seconds. I think I think we should have a round of applause. Yeah. There were a lot of people there supporting him. He did an unbelievable job. It was it was heroic. It was. Oh. Great, great, hey, Markel, I've already heard from Big John. He says, "Hey, Markel, Big John here." Hmm? Big, John. Big John, you don't know Big oh. John? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know Big John. Okay, so Big John, you're not forgotten. Hang in there. Uh, um, so. Uh, so listen, um, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of uh, love to hear more about 
your recent efforts, Markel, in, in hitting the sub three and qualifying for Boston. Um, but before we do, I think we should maybe look at some of the footage of the film and, and get started that way. What do you think? Okay, so for our viewers at home, I am getting ready to play about five minutes of footage. If for any reason it's pixelated, hang in there. This is getting recorded. You can always go back and watch it when we upload it after the panel today. And this is available in your short films category in the patron portal. Okay, here we go. And panelists, please do mute yourselves. Thanks. My father always said to me, he said, God helps those who help themselves. I think you can help yourself by living a good and healthy life. Love and respect yourself and others. You first have to have respect and love for yourself. If you don't love yourself, how are you going to love your neighbor? I've been pretty fortunate in my life. How are you doing? You know, a lot of guys haven't had the advantages I've had. They've had a tough time and been in tough situations and they've made mistakes. Typically, I don't question any of the inmates about their crimes. If they want to discuss them with me, I'll discuss them with them. It really doesn't matter much to me what they've done in the past. What matters to me is what are they doing now and what are they going to do in the future. We all make mistakes and we hopefully learn from our mistakes and go forward. My goal is to run under three hours, maybe qualify for Boston. Here, be the first one to do that. I started running to stay focused on my main goals, and that's to get out, have my freedom. But while I'm here, stay focused on uh, staying right, doing the right things, and the board because I know that I had to go to the board and I've seen so many people after being denied five, six, seven years, they get stressed out. And uh, somebody that I knew that, I, that was, became a good friend of mine that worked at PIA with me, he ended up killing himself. I know it's stressful and people handle things differently and I won't let that happen to me. I think run is the toughest sport there is. I think it's tougher than football. I think it's tougher than boxing. It takes a lot of endurance. So the type of people that I'm running alongside with are people that um, have determination, have grit, have stamina, and also help each other have those same qualities. 2014, I completed my first half marathon. This year, I'm determined to finish the 26. You got a squad's notice, man. I, I keep getting to give you. Still living in the end? 310? All right.
what started me running was, I don't like sitting at tables talking about prison stuff. You hear the same stories, but it's just a different face. And it's like, I don't want to hear this. So I just run. And everybody on the yard, like, when I first started, they're like, you're going to be run a marathon, huh? And a lot of guys said, yeah, right, Tommy, because I was like, <laughs> been running for a year and a half. I've got 2,500 miles in. I lost over 55 pounds. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Even some of the melees and the riots in here had nothing on how I felt after that marathon. I went under a four hour marathon, that's all I want. The thought of running 26.2 miles in or out of prison is, is incredibly intimidating, but for a lot of people, it's the journey of actually getting there, getting to the starting line and having the confidence that, yeah, I can do this. My goal today is to complete the marathon. But the thing is, when I'm at six miles, Markel's finished. So I want to see if I can. See if I can. <laughs> yeah, most people are halfway done by the time Markel's done. Perfect day. Perfect day. Better you day. couldn't get a better day. Oh, did Frank put the cones out? Did he come in early? Yeah. yeah. Frank did? Yeah. Shoes that are donated don't belong to us, they belong to the state. So they're stored in these lockers. We gotta give them my ID in order to get the shoes. And when we finish, we gotta return them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. Y'all ready? Great, ready. Those shoes look ready. Dude, the shoe, at least the shoes are ready. Buenos dias, buenos dias. Buena suerte. Hey, Jim, how you doing? How you doing? Three minutes. We're going in three minutes. Welcome back, everyone. I Again, that was not the most pristine way to view the footage. We really encourage you to go back and watch it. But it does give us a little bit of a flavor of why this is so important for us to be talking about the film today, talking about getting it done, and the content, obviously, of course. Um, Christine, I, I want to go back to you, uh, start with you. Um, the film is, uh, the footage is gorgeous. It's just the photography is beautiful. I think it really, it, it, it highlights your, your subjects and the story is already so rich visually. So um, can you tell us about, um, oh, are you, are you muted? Can you not unmute? Sorry, I'm having also my cat is like, right. <laughs> Listen, this is COVID. We're going to get through this. It's okay. Um, but we're both honking outside. Yeah, it's, so, it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. We're, we're together. That's all that matters. So can you tell us a little bit about, I want to get to some of that visual richness that you start to tell the story with, but lead us into how this even started for you. Why did this story grab your attention above a gazillion other stories out there? Uh I actually woke up one morning looking at my phone and I saw this GQ magazine article actually about the San Quentin Marathon. And by the time I finished the article, I mean, I, I, I kept on getting this picture in my head um, of that a Van Gogh painting, uh, Prisoners, you know, where they, those guys just like in that circle in that sort of, you know, prison like dungeon space. And uh, I couldn't get that image out of my head. And then I had had also, you know, personal experience with the prison system through somebody else that I knew. And so that just sort of, you know, really, you know, where the world of, of running, I have, I'm not, I'm definitely not in the same, like even close to where, what these guys do running wise, but you know, I'm a rec, do some recreational <laughs> running. So I could sort of see, you know, and feel from my own experience, you know, how transformative running can mm. be and mixed with the criminal justice side was something that I was very interested in. So I was like, by the end of the article, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I have to do this somehow as a film. And when was that? Contacted Frank and went from there. And when was that? Oh, you're muted, I think, Catherine. Or I, or I can't hear you, hold on, yeah. Go ahead. When was that? 
Oh, sorry. Um, that was in uh, June 2016, actually, is when I first read the article. And originally, um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually coming from a narrative background. So I had actually originally approached him as a narrative film. But then I um, had an opportunity to go to the half marathon that year, about a month later. And then Frank had arranged for me to meet with um, some of the other coaches and some of the guys who had paroled and, um, you know, came away from that, uh, um, those um, meetings thinking that anything that I could actually make up as a storyteller, like writing dialogue or whatever, just somehow did not bring <laughs> as true as what these guys were telling me, like, you know, straight. So I felt like, you know, I felt like I learned a lot just from these very short interactions. And uh, I felt that the documentary medium would actually be a better, you know, place to space to tell this type of story. And before we move on, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the visual structure that you employed here? Who's doing the DP, that kind of thing? Yeah, the DP is um, a San Francisco based DP. His name is uh, Cliff Trayman. Uh, he had a lot of um, commercial background. Uh, and um, I used worked with primarily an all Bay Area, you know, crew. Um, but really the concept, the structural concept came from the marathon itself. Um, you know, I felt like running would be a great cinematic and visual gateway to, you know, because running is a meditative, you know, internal, as much internal as it is external. So I wanted to, I thought that running would provide a very interesting visual device, cinematic device to you know, explore then their, each individual's background. So um, Frank, question for you. As, so you get this call from Christine back in 2016. Had you ever met Christine before? No. Uh, had anybody ever talked to you before about being in a movie? About doing what? About being in a movie. No, no, I love the, uh, the fellow who did the GQ article uh, had apparently they're starting some uh, do some movies and they contacted me also about the same time. So you you were starting to get famous. Oh, I don't know whether you're getting famous. Or right. not, but he's already very famous. He's yeah. been in all kinds of press. Okay, all over the world actually. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Know, I can't. I'm lucky here to have you know found this. <laughs> but Frank, in all seriousness, so when you were approached by Christine, you had then been coaching for eleven years already at the at the club. Yes. Yes. And so, at this point, it's something that you've been doing for a while. How did it? Did did her? inquisition start to change the way you viewed? Did it change the way you viewed what you were doing at all? Uh, not really. Did you see? So how you're working with the guys and you've been working with Markel for many years, correct? Uh, about six years now. Okay. So when you, when you have camera people and you have journalists and you have directors with you while you're doing what is intrinsic for you and you've been doing for many years, how did that start to shift things for you? Did it, did your, was your focus heightened, your awareness heightened? Did the guys behave any differently? Well, I mean, I, I know that the guys all enjoyed when the uh, film crew would come in and that, that, that would be a big day for them. And, uh, you know, they came in uh, and, and filmed mostly in 2017. And uh, the races or the workouts that they filmed, uh, you know, the, the guys really enjoyed those and we enjoyed them. But, uh, you know, the, that was only a small portion of what we do during the year. Right. And Markel, what about you to suddenly have your, not your day to day, I know that I know the crew wasn't there every day, but to have your story start to be explored in this way in, a, in an almost public way, and then your training in a public way. How did, what was that like for you? 
frightening. <laughs> it was frightening. I mean, I ain't gonna lie to honestly, I mean putting it out there was kind of tough. I was just taking one day at a time, living in the moment and just seeing where I went from there. So. And can you tell us a little bit more about why it was tough? Uh, just in prison, I mean, everything is, unless you're in a self-help group, everything is confidentiality. And then to just actually have your know, stuff all over the world, I mean, it's like, I mean, I found out at first it was tough and it was difficult, but then actually after that, when you really get deep into uh, inner work, it became a blessing instead of a curse. So it actually helped me in the moment. We're going to come back to what you say about staying right. I think that's such an interesting point. Um, and already there's so much to unpack here, all the parallels. So Diana, I love, um, and Tim, were you in that final shot with Diana? Um, right before we cut off? Yeah. Okay, I thought that might be you. <laughs> um, so, Diana, you had been working, or you had both been working at the prison for several years before yeah. the crew came in to start filming. It had already started, the, the club had already started to gain notoriety and had been featured here and there. At this point, when, when the film crew came in, I, and what I'm trying to get at is how how the presence of people paying such a focused attention to what you're doing, how that changed things for you, if at all? Uh, I think for me, it did change things somewhat because at the beginning, like Frank, I was very focused on just my role as a coach, you know, the, um, the, the runners in the club as runners, you know, and I didn't really know much about background. And again, unless someone shared something, I wasn't asking. And I honestly, like Frank, it was just all about like what's coming up in terms of the next race and how are they feeling and how are they eating and very much focused in the moment. And I think that changed first with the GQ article. That was the first time that um, without any names, there were stories in there about mm -hmm how people had ended up at San Quentin. And, you know, I tried not to let it pique my curiosity because also there was some pushback from it. And um, some some people weren't happy about that because it was it, it is kind of oversharing to, it, especially if it's not in the right context, in the right forum and context. And then with Christine's film, it was different because there it was very public and it was very voluntary and it was handled very carefully that people were sharing their stories. Most of that was still done behind the scenes. So for the coaches, you know, in some ways it didn't change stuff, but it did start, you know, filtering through. So we got to know them in a different way, just in a fuller context. But I think the way that it was handled, it was done so well on the production side that everybody was brought up and made comfortable with a more full story and look at the picture than we had had in the past. Yeah, the other the other thing that I think happened, and it's happened with most running clubs that we've been affiliated with, is that people show up to run and get fast and get exercise and all this stuff. But what they end up with is really a community and friendship. Mm -hmm. and, um, very deep, intense friendships. Like what we went through today with Markel, was intense. And there were 12 people there supporting him today. And it, it reminded me how much I missed that about San Quentin. But I think what happened with Christine's crew is they became part of our community, mm. very much so. And they showed up, aired. And the, the running, the results are important, you know, of course. But what's more important is the coaching, camaraderie, guys that don't even run show up in time. And there's all this interaction that goes on. That's wonderful. So it goes way beyond just the pure athletic act of running. It's about community, fellowship, empathizing with guys that are hurting while they're doing. There's a whole bunch of great stuff that goes on. Rehabilitation. What? What did you say, Markel? I said healing and rehabilitation. Yes. But I mean, I, I really sense that 
kind of immediately um, you know, the family community um, relationships. Um, um, so I, and I think that's what actually makes this, um, you know, the Thousand Mile Club such a really unique and very inspiring, uh, you know, inspiring people to be around. So I can't wait to share it with more people. Yeah. And uh, Frank, can you give us just a smidge of history about the running club itself? Well, uh, Laura Bowman was a teacher at uh, San Quentin, and she had actually formed the running club and uh, was looking for a coach. So she gave me a call, and at the time, I was the president of the Tomalpa Running Club, and so I sent out uh, an email to all of the members asking if anybody had any interest in uh, coaching the club, and got no response. So I went in and, uh, you know, worked with them and pretty much treated them like, uh, like I do when I coach uh, the Tamalpa running club. And Diana, you too. How, so how did you heed the call to end up at the, at the prison? Uh, I had heard about Frank's work. There was an article, I think, in the Chronicle, and I know Frank just as a friend. And actually, another mutual friend of ours, Mary Churchill, was one of the early coaches. And we were at dinner, actually, at Frank's house. And uh, she was pregnant and had decided she was going to stop coaching at that point. And that was right when my kids were kind of in middle school and I had more time. Um, so it was really that night that um, I then followed up with Frank about how to get involved and um, and started started there. And Christine, you and I had an opportunity to talk earlier about how in the in the film, what we've seen of the film, the coaches, Frank is very articulate. You know, we don't I don't talk to the guys about why they're here. I let the past be the past and focus on the here and now and the, and the future. And does the film address history with the, uh, with the men at all? Uh, yes. Um, I knew from the outset what sort of the coaches and Frank's, you know, policy really is not to ask the guys about their backgrounds, but, you know, I also felt like as a filmmaker, as a journalist that I had to, um, I felt like it's really part of the story. Um, and, and it also came from just, you know, my own anecdotal experience talking with a bunch of, you know, the guys that even that first time I was there, because, you know, when you look at people and why they're successful, you know, you can usually attribute it to the fact that, you know, they have a family, they, you know, have access to education, they've got a support system. And what I quickly learned about all of, you know, many of these guys is that, you know, they didn't have access to education. They don't necessarily have a support system. Um, a lot of people had uh, addiction problems. Um, and then you've got systemic issues, poverty, racial, you know, issues. Um, and these are also, you know, acts of violence, you know, that we as a society are, you know, perpetuating. And a lot of people, you know, obviously, particularly black and brown people get caught up in this system and, you know, violence begets violence in that way. And so I really felt like it was important not to and because I have also worked in like the true crime genre, you know, I work in like Hollywood true crime, you know, stuff, too. And I didn't, you know, you know, violence and acts of violence, criminal acts are usually used as like plot points. You know, they're very broken down to, you know, create act structure and things like that. Um, and typically they're used as either, you know, the end point of someone's journey that they land in prison or only the, you know, the beginning point where, you know, I kind of felt like it's sort of on the middle of a bell curve, you know, um, that there's a reason why people are there. You know, there is a reason. And they're usually very, you know, I wanted to just sort of connect the dots for people. Um, uh, you know, their people are listed as like violent felons. Um, but, you know, a lot of times, I, and then Diana points this out in the film, I, I have a quote from her saying that, you know, even though people may have committed acts of violence, um, 
you know, these are not necessarily violent people all the time. You know, you'll be surprised at how similar they are to, you know, you and me right here. So that it, it was very important, that, you know, that their criminal background was excavated for that reason, though, not just to sensationalize it, because that, that wasn't the point, but really to show, um, you know, what kind of people have we been putting in our prison system and why? You know, so and you will quickly see patterns, you know, they're all and the, the three subjects of this film, Markel, Rasan Thomas and Tommy Wickard, you know, do have similarities, very different stories to tell. They have very, very different stories to tell, but they are related, you know, um, so. Thank you for that. And I think also uh, just to put a fine point on that, and we already have so many questions coming in. It's fantastic. Um, but to put, put a fine point on that, I appreciate your your lens and your view into that because I feel like if there are these systemic changes that we as a culture and society need to start addressing, we we have we need a we need a view in. We need a view in just to see exactly how things are manifesting and and where where some of those trajectories actually start and how we work upstream to prevent some of, from those you know a, multiple traumas from happening in people's lives that put them in these really awful situations um well i mean but also for me the thing about the thousand mile club and what i really felt really just makes them the, the, the thousand mile club such an empowering great story is because you know when you look at a system like the prison system i mean it's huge you know and usually we as individuals we feel very powerless to do anything that you know what are we going to do to change this you know what what can you do and here's a group of people you know the coaches mm -hmm. and also you know the guys themselves um this is a community of people that are that are making changes in each other's lives and okay. really impacting each other's lives, creating positive change, supporting everybody, supporting people, you know, in the most uh, uh, true fashion, you, you know, and I would hear over and over from the coaches as well that over time, you know, they felt like that they were getting, you know, they've gotten just as much out of the experience as, you know, the runners themselves. And I found that kind of relationship very, you know, dynamic and, you know, and, and very interesting. And, you know, hopefully people can see that, that through their own passion, whether that be running or, you know, whatever you like to do, um, that you can volunteer and get involved and, you know, and make a difference in people's lives. Yeah. And um, uh, we'll go around the horn, but uh, Frank, Tim and Diana, can you talk a little bit about that, about how this work has impacted you? Diana, please. Um, for me, I mean, it's impacted me in so many ways. Um, but one thing along the lines of what Christine is saying, you know, I, I was so inspired just thinking about these stories of people who ended up in prison and with, you know, like long sentences and in some cases, no hope of ever getting out. And yet they chose, you know, they're, they're, they chose to join this club and to make running important in their lives and to have a goal of a marathon. Um, you know, and to me that took so much courage and bravery to even be able to do that as opposed to just feeling like, you know, everything was stacked against you and, you know, and here you are and there's no hope and just curl up in a cell on your bed and just, you know, not get out. Um, but instead here are guys showing up, you know, supporting each other and making a really, you know, positive impact both on themselves. You can see running is transformative. So it was really so great to be part of something where you could see the benefits of it, um, but also inspired by people who made that choice and who, who did decide to participate and be part of the club. Thank you. How about you, Tim? Yeah, to address, I mean, for us, we get so much more out of it than we give. There's no, you can't even measure it. Um, and part of it is it's, it's a literal step. You know, they run around a hundred times for the marathon and it's step by step by step. And it's really kind of like life, just one step at a time. And, and I've had guys come up to me and say, you know, that's the hardest thing I've ever done, finishing that marathon. I'm like, mm -hmm. 
you've been in here for 24 years. And that's, you know, it's like, it's, and it's so intense, but to get that message and get that, to, to be able to deliver that type of experience for guys that are inside and have them appreciate it. And they talk about the marathon, like they're going around this quarter mile loop, you know, and, but they talk about the different miles and splits and they get into it and they become students of the sport and, mm -hmm. and it's really it changes them, but it also changes us because we, we walk out of there and the courage and the, uh, the intensity and the will to finish something that we see on that track, it's second to none. I've never seen anything like it. So it's like, are you kidding me? I go in every day to help those guys. How about you, Frank? Well, really, uh, the last couple of years, things have changed considerably. <clears throat> we, uh, it, so far in 2020, we had 15 guys go to the parole board and 12 of them got favorable uh, hearings and are being paroled. And we're starting to see more and more of these guys actually getting out and we're making a big effort to try to uh, you know, keep the guys who are getting out active in the running and supporting them on the outside. And uh, it's, it's the, f the first several years that I was there, you know, there were very few guys who were getting paroled. And, and you know, I would deal with you know, maybe four or five over a, a period of uh, four or five years, but now we're getting you know much, a lot more coming out, and uh, most of them are doing quite well. And Markel, how about you to have all these people show up and coach you running, run? You know, I'm sure run alongside part of your, your race this morning. What is that like for you? Hmm. Very, uh, I'm appreciative, I'm grateful. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did today without them supporting me in that, in that fashion that they did today. So, um, you know. um, but I mean, running is therapeutic. And I like, I mean, I don't know, I joined the club kind of later on and just looking at how many people it was before and look at from the time that I started and after I was released and then being able to come back in and run with the guys and then go back out, you know, it impacted them in such a special way. And it's like more and more people are joining and more and more people are getting that therapy that they need to stay focused because it's discipline, even in trying to stay focused and to be able to reach your goal to complete a marathon at the end of the year. So I think that mental tenacity and focus is what helped a lot of people all want to get out of prison. That's mm -hmm. why I, I run free. I run free. Yes. I love that. Um, well, we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. The, the first one I do want to address is someone asked, what is a DP? And I should have clarified, uh, DP is a director of photography for those who are watching and may not have this lingo for which there's an acronym for everything. Uh, so director of photography. And um, we have several questions here about your shirt, Christine. <laughs> Can people buy those shirts? Um, I hope so. <laughs> we print more, I think, a lot of, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll make those oh, good. available. Um, Go to our, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make them available Perfect. through our website. Yeah, we had sort of like a limited number of these. Um, but yeah, yeah I, have, I have <laughs> three <laughs> questions here asking about that t-shirt. <laughs> oh, that's um, And uh, Markel, question for you. Who is your favorite running partner? Oh. Does that put you on the spot? <laughs> you don't have to include anyone on 
Um, Put it this way. We had to, we say, had to, we're on place today to keep this. up. I'm going to say this. It's a collective of everybody who supported me running, whether it was in training or whether it was doing a marathon. I say everybody who was involved with getting me here. Okay. Everybody. Hmm. Great. <laughs> um. Oh, how weird. Somebody's telling me there's no sound. I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, oh, um, you know what, uh, Diana, question for you. How do the men maintain a marathon runner's diet? Since you mentioned that. Well, uh, yeah, in terms of um, food is really important for a marathon, um, and there are much more limited choices and options at San Quentin. So, um, that, you know, we, we do talk about food. Frank brings nutrition for that day in the form of goo and gels. And um, we have an electrolyte uh, drink that day. But in terms of leading up to it, there are guys who will, you know, uh, you can buy or trade for peanut butter and tuna and they try they will try to do things to get the type of higher protein diet that you that is good for uh, building up to the marathon but it's 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 not an easy thing i mean there are a lot of challenges about running a marathon at san quentin i mean in addition to around the you know just once around is a quarter of a mile so the over 100 laps for a marathon um you know there's nutrition there is uh during the course of the race you have to there are often bells where you have or alarms um, you have to stop, get down on your knees and wait until that's over and then get up again and continue the race and Frank times it, stops the clock and they start again. So there are all sorts of challenges that you don't otherwise have. And one of them is, is nutrition. So they do their best and we talk and we try to you know work around it, but there's it's certainly not an easy thing. One interesting thing was when, Mar when uh, Markel came out and ran Boston, you know, it was like, it was so close to when he had been inside and we had to sort of, you know, well, you were used to doing this type of diet. Now you're on the outside. There are more oh, choices. We had to be careful because it was introducing, you know, new choices that were not there before. And Markel, why were you laughing at that? <laughs> yeah, he, he, could, he could answer what he was eating on race day. I remember. Is very, is, <laughs> unless you can... Like she said, barter and trade, hustle, if you don't get packaging this, where you can, I mean, you have to be on a certain diet to get through the good vegetables inside the prison in the kitchen. I mean, it's a poor diet. I mean, very hard, poor diet. It's not the same as being on the streets and eating healthier, eating more nutritious food. What was your first goo like? <laughs> I didn't know what was what they was trying to use to set me up so I could run slower or not. <laughs> actually, but, I didn't have that. But I actually, it did help me. So, I mean, you know, it did. It. But I didn't know. I was like, man, this is supposed to give me energy. I'm going to see about that. But because at first, my first marathon, all I used was salt water. Wow. Yeah. yeah I remember Markel was very distrustful of the goo. <laughs> I am too. It's <laughs> like, what? What is this? Like, I, we we actually got some footage of that. And stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, so uh, there are a couple more uh, questions, Markel. Th uh, this is a great question. What was your previous background in track and field, and uh, how was, if uh, assuming you have one, what was the transition like to distance running? Oh, that's nice. Um, well, I ran two years of high school track and field and one season of junior college. So I went my junior year, I ran track, I ran the 800 to 400, and then my senior year, I ran the 800 to 400 in the mile. And then after that, in junior college, I, uh, oh, and I ran cross country my senior year uh, to get for the mile, to get Master of the mile because my coach told me he said he wanted me to try the mile your senior year. So I did cross country first and then I did the mile. And then after that, I transitioned in the junior college and I ran one season of track. 
But the difference is I'm slower. I don't have the speed that I used to have. So I figure I can stretch the distance. And I, and I really believe like it's good for people who are still like running or whatever they want to do to get it to get out of it um, that they can run distance. I can't I mean I I mean, I don't know. I don't have it like I used to have it, but I, I can still run. Well, we have another question about swag. So we have the t-shirts here, which hopefully will be a fundraising uh, vehicle. But also, Markel, it sounds like you have a, no, a new clothing line coming out. You want to tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually wearing my, one of my jumpsuits now. Uh -oh. oh, let let's see. Can you hold it up? Run free. Run That's free. Markel, the And look. Pocket of the Running Man, the Jordan, and then I have a T-shirt. But that's just a little bit of it. I have women clothing and all of that. So if it wasn't for Frank and all of them coming in and helping us inside the prison, uh, I mean, truthfully, even with my religious services, uh, you know, I was, you know, baptized in 2009 as a Jehovah's Witness, and that helps a little bit, but um, I still stressed out. I was still like having this other these other issues, and it wasn't until like that couple with self help groups with inner work and mainly focusing on running is what brought everything together and helped me to be more focused. And that's why before I even got out, I was already free in, the, in my head in my mind. I was already happy and free. And it was because of people like Frank and Tim and Diane and Christine who helped us to be better individuals just by showing up and being there for us. Mm. Well said. You know, we're going to get to, Christine, I'm going to give you a few minutes to talk about what you need to get the film done. Uh, we'll put up some links where people can learn more about the film and even make a contribution. But before we get there, could we do a round robin of uh, words of inspiration for other folks who are currently incarcerated? Uh, whether it's about running or if it's something, a spiritual idiom, is there anything that you would care to share? And Markel, we'll go with you last. So Frank, how about we start with you? I'm not sure uh, I understand exactly what you want. Um, is there anything you might say to other folks who are incarcerated right now? Well, I mean, I deal with, you know, the guys who are in there and, uh, you know, my feeling is whether it's through athletics, through running or through whatever other self-help programs, education, religious programs, whatever, to, you know, to take advantage of what's available. And I think San Quentin's got quite a bit available. And, uh, you know, try to be as good as you can be at uh, whatever activity you, uh, you decide that you're going to put your efforts towards. Tim, how, how about you? I'd reflect what, what Frank said, take advantage of the programs and, um, and the, the programs, you know, to just to call them programs is very superficial. A lot of them, uh, guys are looking at themselves and they're looking at other issues in, in the world, but they're peeling layers of the onion back and they're getting very deep into some, some serious stuff, but continue to do that work. And um, it's, it's incredible the growth that comes out of all of the all the programs, including the running and the restorative justice and whatnot. So just keep keep faith. And Diana? Uh, I mean, I would echo that, all of that. And I guess I would also say to, you know, remain hopeful because it keeps, um, you know, it keeps you going and gets you out and doing things. And that's what's important and making connections. Um, and to the extent programs are available, um, you know, a lot of people don't have the time to work on themselves, you know, so it is the, the you know, to the, they have time on their hands. And that's one thing you can do with that time is just work on yourself and 
and remain hopeful and you know take advantage of people and programs around you to get get through it. And Markel, any any words of inspiration you care to share? Yes. Uh, never give up, um, regardless of how tough and how hard it is. Because um, there was times I I never thought I would ever see freedom. I mean, but I just kept my focus. And even if you don't have, like, there's other institutions that don't have what San Quentin has, and you just got to do your best to tough it out and just continue to stay focused on just, if you really want it, um, it'll be there for you. Just don't give up. Um. Wow, Christine, I, I, I'm so moved by whatever nexus you've kind of channeled to bring all these wonderful people together. Can you tell us how we can support you to get your story complete? Well, we are inching closer to the finish line. It has been definitely a, a long process, several year process. And I definitely thank the Thousand Mile Club for all of their patience, uh, especially Frank. I know has been like so anxious about it, uh, but it, you know, it's just, it's taken time. Um, and hopefully, you know, people will see that it's worth it. Um, you know, we, I'm an independent filmmaker, so we always are fundraising, you know, that's like the story of my life. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It doesn't it just doesn't stop ever um so you know there's there's always um stuff that we need to do that needs monetary support um we do have a um a fundraising page that people can get a tax deduction you know for a contribution um and we hope that the film can also be seen at you know our kind of social impact goal if you will with the film too that we're raising money for is um, trying to get the film screened at, at as many prisons as possible. You know, I mean, I, I have heard from um, the coaches, um, another coach who isn't here today, Kevin, um, has talked, uh, you know, extensively too about um, forming thousand mile clubs in different prisons, you know, um, and I don't think a lot of prisons are as progressive, obviously, as San Quentin. So hopefully, you know, the movie can be a bridge for prison administrations to see that, you know, this works. It really mm -hmm. works. And, um, you know, both for community engagement for the prison and uh, for obviously the people who, who are running. So, um, you know, we're hoping to be able to take the film, uh, you know, out to facilities where, where people normally wouldn't get to see it. And this is the url for the film itself can people access the donate um capability through the website as well yes i believe so okay yes, yes. um oh well frank says yes he must know um well uh i i can't thank you all enough for taking the time um christine can you see oh this guy oh, yeah. <laughs> I have spent the better part of the last 10 minutes trying to keep that cat from coming into frame. <laughs> yeah, I have one in front of me, so. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, it should be done, you know, by the end of the year is what is what we're looking at and be ready to debut it uh, 2021. So hopefully people uh, will look out for it and uh, check check it out and, and keep following us. And, um, you know, it's really truly has been a joy you know, I'm just as excited about this project today um, as I was when I first read that article, really. So, um, and it's really a testament, I think, to what the Thousand Mile Club is really all about. You know, it's sort of an, an endless treasure trove of, you know, stories and experiences and relationships and just really fascinating people on transformational journeys. Mm. Well, thank you all for sharing a little bit with us today. I think this has been uh, a really good use of 55 minutes. And I hope that you all feel a little bit more connected with each other. Uh, there's a whole, there's and, and several of us who are um, watching and connecting with you right now. And, and that's so important. And it seems to be the real, um, the real kernel of, of what you've worked for with this. I Shout out to the rest of my team, too. There are some people that are watching. I know uh, Zahada, who's an associate producer, who came in a lot 
um, into San Quentin with me, um, Sarah Luke, who's also a producer, um, Jonathan Chu, who paroled, I know that he's watching. Um, so I'm, you know, deeply appreciative of, um, you know, my team and everybody here in the club to really make this at all. Eddie, you're right now. Oh. What's that, Markel? I said to Christine, Eddie Harena. Oh, Eddie Harena is there? No. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, well, he's part of, yeah, all of the fun, too. <laughs> well, and Markel, congrats again. You're going to hit it. I know you are. Three hours. Not anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you again for taking the time to come chat with us. Uh, Christine, we'll count on you to keep us keep us posted on progress. Yeah? Yes. People can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram uh, is SQ Marathon. And Facebook, we're under our movie name, 26.2 to Life. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. We'll hope to see you on the big screen soon. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. And for the rest of you, thank you so much for taking the afternoon and joining us. Stories like these are exactly why we do what we do. It's wonderful connect. And if we can't do it in person, at least we can get together virtually. So until we see you next time, stay sane, stay safe, and stay connected.